Hey, can you, uh, can you say hi to our online church today? Make them feel at home today. They're coming from all over the place. We got like 35, 40 people online today. That was not a good hello. Can you do that again, please? Say hi to our online church. So, so glad that you're here with us, wherever you're coming at us from. We're glad that you're with us. Hey, I want to just make one mention of that song right there. So, the, so that line, w- one of the lines, the riches of your love will always be enough. And so listen, I feel compelled to almost tell you that um, it's the only thing that will be enough. Does that make sense? It's the only thing that will be. We, we look for so many things so often, especially at this time of the year. Like how many parents, um, like you are so anticipating and excited about Christmas Day and the look on your kid's face. Are you there? Can I get a parent to say yes? Amen. It's awesome. And then as you look back over the last Christmases, can you remember the disappointment in your face when you realized it wasn't enough? You know what I'm saying? Like, listen, like, uh, my kids are, I can talk about my kids because none of them are here today. None of them are in the room. Um, but they are, uh, they get to that spot where you're like, that's it? And I want to slap every one of them. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you kidding me? That's it? It's, it's got to be, thank you, Aaron. Appreciate it. I feel a little bit alone up here today. Um, it's got to be a spot where we recognize what really is that we're trying to get to and how to really help them find what joy is. That, I think, isn't that what we try to do? We try to fabricate joy on Christmas by giving them all these gifts and all these things. And, and, and what, I mean, it gives them a momentary happiness, but it doesn't ever give them joy. It won't give them joy. Joy only can come from Christ. It can only be his filling and his sufficiency that gets us to what is enough. Listen, my kids are walking in the door right now. I got to stop talking. What in the world? Hello. <laughs> that was kind of like amazing mo- timing right there. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Um, have, you ever, have you ever, like, uh, and I know you have, so just join me in this. Just say yes, okay? No? Okay. You're like, what am I going to say yes to? Like, it's easy. It's a safe one. Like, um, you lost something, and it just drove you crazy because you couldn't find it. And, and you don't even know to look for it until, like, the moment that you need it, and then you're just scouring the house, like, turning over everything and just trying to find that one thing. It could be the most insignificant thing, right? But I need it now, and I don't want to have to look for it. This, this, like, for us with our 75 kids and all this house full of stuff, like, stuff goes missing all the time um, for a number of reasons because our kids will just, like, what's this? And they'll take it, and they'll hide it somewhere. They'll just do something with it. Like, it's amazing to us when you go, like, to wash the sheets, the things that you find around the bed. You know what I mean? Like, first of all, that's where all the socks have disappeared to. Why? I don't know. But there they are. And then there's just random stuff that they hide. They just want to, usually it's a pile of candy wrappers or, you know, whatever else. But this week I had, I had, to, I had, I had to go do something and I needed to find this thing that I had purchased a while back. And I couldn't find it anywhere. I'm, I'm looking everywhere to, to, to find this, this little, it most, ins- like I said, super insignificant. It's a $3 whatever, but I need it now. And I don't want to have to look for it. And so you know what happens when you do that? You start blaming people, right? I mean, it's like your fault. What'd you do with my whatever? And like, I haven't touched you. I don't even know what you're talking about. I can't. It's your problem. Well, what I found was that I had actually strategically, knowing that this was going to happen, I placed it right next to where I was going to use it. But I didn't remember I had done that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, that was like months ago. It's insignificant. I'm not going to store that in my mind. I'm not going to keep that there. It was just whatever. We lost it. You didn't really lose it. You just put it somewhere else. You just misplaced it. I want to help you today understand that the joy you are finding is just right in front of you. It's just right there. All of us, at some point or another, at some different place in our journey, we are looking for the fullness of joy. And how do we find it? I want to help you find it. Fair enough? Be with me. Y'all are super quiet today. It's scaring me. Um, first of all, Maybe a couple things. I just really feel like we should just be a little bit more informal today. But um, forgive me. So the first song that we sang today. Do y'all know this first song that we sang today? Our little church wrote that song. That's a Grand Point Church original. Yes, sir. Um, and it actually went over a lot better than I thought it would. Good job. Um, 
we were we were a little collectively little, ner- little nervous about how that was going to go down, but I just think that's pretty cool. Our, our little team put that together. Uh, Andrea put most of the lyrics into that song, so there you go. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, I also need to let you know that, man, we had a super fun time yesterday with our lo- our Christmas caroling thing. We had 60 people, somewhere around there, 58, 60 people. It was so good, and, and we, like, so did ride the church bus, and we looked as ghetto as that sounds. I even got on the bus. I was like, I feel like we are the Sister Act movie right now. But we had a good time, man. We got to put a lot of smiles on a lot of faces and then came back here and got into a drunken cookie stupor. It was great. So, yeah, that was, I yeah, know, right? Don't, don't do that. Um, but we had a good time. And then I, I need to also let you know about something special that we're doing today. This is a surprise, so don't tell anybody. Can I do this when we're live streaming? I shouldn't do that. Probably shouldn't do that. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, probably shouldn't do that. We're going to do something at the 11 o'clock service that's not happening right now, okay? So, you, you want to, you should be here. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably all I can say. I know, I'm sorry. So, if you want, you're like, what in the world? You're going to have to stick around. Um, where are we? I want to read to you a, a passage of scripture that is just so, so familiar. Um, this is Luke chapter 1, verse number 26. And I'm going to read from the Passion Translation today. It says this, during the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, remember, we talked, about Eliz- we, we talked about Zach and Liz last week, right? Talked about Zach and Liz last week. Your prayer has been heard. I love that. Um, during the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel, same angel that went to talk to Elizabeth, same angel, okay? He's a busy guy. Was sent from God's presence to an unmarried girl named Mary with blue balloons, right? Oh, wait. I mean, come on. That's the best I got for today. (laughs) Living in Nazareth, a village in Galilee, she was engaged to a man named Joseph, a true descendant of King David. Now, listen, I want you to, um, I want to dive into this just a little bit. We're going to look at Mary for just a few minutes today. Uh, We're actually going to dive into the same story and talk about Jesus a little bit next week. But you need to know this, like what, um, uh, they're going to present like Jesus, Mary and Joseph's lineage and what what they're trying to do. You don't see this in every gospel, only two of them. Um, John doesn't include a, a lineage at all, a history, a family, ancestry, ancestry.com. He's not there um, because uh, the son of God, a God doesn't have a lineage. He's just there. And so John presents Jesus as the son of God. Well, he's, that's it. It's just God and Jesus. And I, I think, uh, who's the other one that doesn't include an, an-, an ancestry? Is it Mark? I think it's Mark. Mark doesn't do it either. And the reason why is because um, Mark presents Jesus as the servant of man, and a servant wouldn't have a lineage either. So the other two, Matthew and Luke, include this. And from this passage from Luke, Luke wants to trace Joseph's ancestry all the way back to Adam, I believe. And he hits, um, he, he does, for real. But he hits like the line of David. And what it's important for us to understand is because that fulfills a prophecy. It actually said that Jesus was going to be um, in the line of David, that David was going to be the great, 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 whatever grandfather of the Messiah. So it's there, and it's important for him to know that. But what we need to understand is that it says this in this verse, that he was a true descendant of King David. Well, why is that important? It's because that they want you to know that this king, this Messiah that's about to be promised, that's about to be like, here he's coming. It's, this is the fulfillment of what's been spoken of, what we talked about 700 years prior during the first week of this series. It, that's important to know. It's a useless tidbit of information for you to understand today. But in the grand scheme of things, you need to understand that that's a big deal. It's a big deal that that's there. He is a true descendant of King David. Now, I think it's also ironic and important that... This is said of Joseph, because Joseph wasn't actually like an earthly relation to Jesus, was he? No, he was just like stepdad, sort of. He's been given like this amazing gift of being able to be in the a fatherly role of this son of God. Now, uh, it's it's really peculiar and interesting that you can find or you can see that uh, Joseph isn't mentioned after Jesus is eight years old. I have no idea why. It's really peculiar. I would love to find out why, like, why is there just this, like, 
Here he is. You see, we're going to talk about this in the first week in January, where Jesus and Mary and Joseph go to, this, to go to the temple. They go to their annual, you know, pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And after that, you don't ever hear of Joseph again. Why? Something happened to him? Did he die? Did he leave? What happened to this guy? I, I don't know. If you have the answer, let's, let's talk. Anyway. Next verse says this, Gabriel appear, appeared to her and said, grace to you, young woman, for the Lord is with you. And so, because of that, and so you are anointed with great favor. I just love the fact that he just says, the Lord is with you, and because the Lord is with you, you have great favor. Do you feel like you have great favor today? It's not a trick question. Do you feel like it? I mean, I think you, you can and maybe you don't. I think the reality that we need to get to is that it really is based beyond feelings. You need to understand that it's just there. It's there. The Lord said he, he will be with you. I got, I got some verses for you. This is like scattered all throughout the Bible. Joshua 1.9, he said this to Joshua. He says, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Don't be frightened and don't be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you. But not just any time. He says, wherever you go, he's like, I'm with you all the time. Isaiah 41.10, he says, fear not, for I am with you. Don't be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Matthew 28, verse 20, he said, this is kind of midpoint, but he's telling us, his, his eventual servants uh, of church growth, right? He says, go and teach them to observe all that I have commanded you, and be behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And Zephaniah 3.17, how many of you read that book this morning? Zephaniah 3.17, for the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. I like that one. I kind of want to read that book now, right? No? Okay, good. Hebrews 3.13.5 says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. And Psalm 23, 4, you all know Psalm 23, probably the most recognized psalm in all the Bible, Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Listen, if there's ever a question that you might have about the Lord's favor on or around you, it might be some supernatural thing to have that Mary may or not have had, but you need to understand that the Lord is with you. Well, as much as the Lord was with her, he is with you. Make sense? It's not, it's not some special thing about Mary that God is going to choose her to do this amazing supernatural event. It's the fact that he was with her. And because he was with her, she had great favor. And you need to know that when you walked into church today, you walked in with him. And because you walked with him, you have great favor. What does great favor mean? It means the same as grace. It's the same thing. The unmerited favor of God is the same as the unmerited grace of God. You walk hand in hand with God's grace. And that is huge. Because you're not getting what you do deserve. You're beyond it. I gotta ask. Um, you know, when you, I really want to just drill down into Mary just for a minute, because when we get, as it says, this angel says, Gabriel, grace, you know, he's holding his blue balloons, and he says, grace to you, young woman. Like, we typically read the Bible through the filter of our own culture. Understand? And so when it says that she's a young woman, and she's engaged to be married we immediately get in our mind this like 21 to 29 year old young woman who's ready for this and she's like anticipating, you know, this amazing event that's going to happen and why wouldn't this be a joyous occasion? Yeah, it's a little bit obscure and peculiar how this is all going to come about, but we get in our mind that she's equipped, right? And you all know where I'm going with this, but... How old do you think Mary actually was? I mean, because there, like I said, we interpret the Bible through our own reality. Well, culture in that day was that a young woman engaged was between 12 and 16 years old. 
this is not a young woman. This is like an old child. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, this is ridiculous. Like, I look at this story, and I'm like, why would, why would God choose this? Like, how in the world is she going to actually be able to do this? And I also had to think about, like, for a moment, like, think about this for just a minute. How much do you entrust to your children? You laugh. Because I had to think through this for just a minute. I mean, I have a 12-year-old son, and I'm like, let me cut that for you. You know what I mean? Why? Well, because I remember the time when I was like nine and I about sliced my finger off, cutting an apple. So I'm like, no, let me, let me do that for you. You know what I mean? You precious little thing, sit down before you hurt yourself. <laughs> we immediately want to like protect them and keep them safe and secure. And here's the God of the universe saying, Gabriel, go talk to that 12-year-old and let her know that she is going to be the mother of the Son of God. What? Not only is she just an old child, but she's essentially going to be a single mom. Wow. Like this puts everything in a different perspective because it totally goes outside the confines of what we would entrust God's son to. First of all, it, it kind of tells me that maybe I need to, am I trusting my kids with enough opportunity? You know what I mean? Like, can I grant them a little bit more? Can I give them a little bit more opportunity to mold and to make who they are as children of God rather than sons of Kevin? Children of, does that make sense? I also came to the kind of this understanding that the Lord looks at them with much more favor and ability than I ever will. I mean, what would the Lord come to my children over and say, hey, I've got this for you? And then they're sequentially going to come to me and say, hey, dad, Kevin, or God, talk to me about this. What do you think? And what's my response going to be? I mean, can you imagine the conversation that Mary had with dad? Hey, dad, this angel came. He brought me blue balloons. And he told me I'm going to have a baby. And he's going to be the son of God. I mean, do you realize how hard this must have been for her? How difficult it must have been for her to walk into this zone? Look at her response. She says this. And the angel, he, he continues on. He says, he will be supreme, be known as the son of the highest. I don't want to dive into that today. Um, and the Lord will enthrone him as king of his, on his ancestor David's throne. He will reign as king of Israel forever, and he will reign. his reign will have no limit. And so naturally, Mary's going to say, but how could this happen? I'm still a virgin, and... Gabriel answered, the spirit of holiness will fall on you and the almighty God will spread his shadow of power over you in a cloud of glory. And isn't that always how it happens? Let that sink in for a minute. I just need to let you know, because all of us immediately go to that how question. Look, let's, just, let's displace ourselves for just a minute from what's actually happening here, Okay. Like, take Mary and the promise of Gabriel out of it. Put yourself into that. Not as, like, you know, you're going to be the mother of the Son of God. No, 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 not that. I'm just saying that there's an element of impossibility here, right? And Mary's naturally saying, how? I don't get this. This is strange and somewhat cool at the same time. And Gabriel's answer is just... The power of the Spirit of God is involved in this. You know, I don't know about where you're at and what you're facing, what you're wrestling with, what you're going through, but frequently the Lord is directing us and driving us and pushing us up against like ridiculous impossibility that we don't know how. And ironically, this is one of the only spots in the Bible that the Lord kind of dives into the how. And maybe it's just his unmerited favor that's for Mary. Maybe it's just this, maybe it's the fact that this is the Son of God. He's going to describe to her the how. I, I bet you and I wish just together 
don't you just wish there was a moment that the Lord would just tell you how? How are we going to make it through this? How are we going to proceed to the, how are we going to survive this situation? Hey, the spirit of holiness is going to come over you. Like there's no difference from you and Mary. It's the same spirit. It's the same power. It's the same understanding. Like, let his encouragement to her through the how be the same one that you have for you. Well, that's how. Listen, I don't know all the details, but I just know that he's how. Okay, let's just understand that he is the how, right? We can, we can survive with that. And then he says this, this is why the child will be born to you, will be holy. He will be called the son of God. What's more, your aged aunt Elizabeth will also become pregnant with a son. The barren one is now in her sixth month. And listen to this, not one promise of God is empty of power, for, the, for nothing is impossible with God. Not one word that he speaks in your direction is empty of power, because he stands behind it. It's not. Y'all should be just a little bit more excited about that. And then it says this. Check this out. This has got to be 12-year-old Mary. Nothing else. Because Mary responded saying, this is so cool. This is amazing. I will be the mother for the Lord. And as his servant, I accept whatever he has for me. Can you just say, I accept? Now, can you say it like you mean it? I accept. That's good. Now, what were you saying that about? Because, you know, we don't really know. I, I love this, this element of, like, super naivety because she has no clue what she's going to face in the coming years. But she just is like, this sounds awesome. It sounds like you got it figured out. I'm in. Now, let's just, let's just contrast this for just a minute about the story we talked about last week. Because almost the same set of situations, almost the same set of impossibilities, right? And here we've got Zach and Liz, and this same angel comes to Zach and says, in your old age, you're going to have a baby boy. Your, your wife's going to have this baby. And his immediate response is, you expect me to believe this? I mean, why is it? that for a 12-year-old to accept the impossibility of God based on the word of an angel, and yet this old guy who's got all this biblical experience and church knowledge is like, you expect me to believe that? And then I kind of wonder, like, where you fall in the mix. Because it just seems like as we grow older and as we get more mature and experienced in our world and our walk, our belief system tends to erode and it just kind of goes away. We begin to lose over time this childlike faith that just believes that God can do anything. So what do you do with that? I mean, good Lord, I could, there's so many directions that, that could be chosen to kind of finalize this. I mean, I started with the idea that you need to when you find Jesus, you find joy. That's what we just talked about. He's right there. He's right there. I also, I also see a sense of like, you know, this uh, majestic opportunity and, and the belief that, that you need to have over your life to know that the Lord is able. For with God, nothing is impossible. Like you need to claim that. You need to understand it. You need to own it. How about the favor of God that sits and rests over your life? Maybe that's what you need to take home with today. There's so many different angles that you could wrestle with and understand. And, and I think the only fitting way to wrap this up is just for you to put yourself in front of this holy God and say, God, this is where I'm at, and this is what I believe you're speaking to me about today, and this is where I need to go with it. So why don't you do that? Why don't you just take a moment right now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and just get in front of this God? What is it? What are you facing? What's the impossible that you're looking at, that you're wrestling through? And in your mind and your way and your power and your strength, there's just no way. Couldn't it be sometimes that the Lord leads us to those impossibilities because he wants us to understand his strength? What's impossible to us is just a flick of a wrist.
Eucharist for him. God, I want to pray over this church. Lord, the more I get to know you, the more I see, the more I get involved in church and in these people's lives, the more I realize and understand that you are just constantly driving us and directing us towards greater trust. You just want us to trust you. You just want us to depend on you. And so, God, I pray today. I pray today for us as individuals, as God followers, Lord, that we would see these elements and these threads of impossibility and we know that you are faithful and that you are good and that you are kind and that you are honest and that you just want to see us to see you in your greatest power. And God, I know that in this church and in this body, Lord, there's so many stories of, of impossibility, Lord, that you have directed these people to. They're up against walls, they're in corners, they're, they're up against so many different things that we cannot even fathom. And so, God, I pray that in this moment, in this, in this season of their life, Lord, that they would see you, they would see and recognize, Lord, your great power and your delight in showing and showing off, Lord, your strength and your splendor. Lord, give them the strength and hope to continue on another day. And Lord, we just thank you so much for your grace and your mercy and your unmerited favor, Lord, that's to all of us that you are with. 